Hello everybody, this is Renee, and I'm back again with some more The Lordship of Christ. It's one of our Sunday school books that we're doing, and we're going to jump right in to chapter 8 and 9 today. It's going to be short and sweet, just getting back in the swing of things. So the name of chapter 8 is going to be Abraham Kuyper and his successors. Um, you know, a brief, a little brief history about Abraham Kuyper. Um, this is really what this chapter was about and just kind of the movement he started, which um, is, you know, pretty much what I like to think about it as the Christ for all life. So it's not just that Christ is only Lord of spiritual things, but uh, essentially he's Lord over every square inch of the creation. So it's pretty cool. He's a very good guy. Um, our, you know, Pastor Martin loves reading about him. You know, a lot of reformed guys like the, like him just because of the stance he takes. You know, in the sense of that Christ is essentially in every single sphere of our life. You know, a little bit of history though. Um, and it's kind of cool how you see the Lord work here. He attended a university that was super liberal. And unfortunately, uh, Abraham Kuyper was infected with that liberalism. But praise be to God that in 1863, the Lord snatched him out of that. You know, like anything, you know, we can always find ourselves in a not glorif Lord glorifying spot. But as we see here, even being in a super liberal school, he snatched him out of there. So after his conversion, he became a minister, and then a couple years later, he embraced the Orthodox Reformed theology, and then he ended up, uh, you know, causing some shockwaves in his arena. Uh, he, I guess, at that time, it was uh, the French Revolution was going on, and the Age of Enlightenment, all that stuff, and you know, things that we learned in high school here in, in the United States. So in the end, he ended up becoming part of the him and his buddy, uh, Grown Van Prinsterer. I probably butchered his name. Sorry about that. But um, him and his buddy, they were big proponents of, uh, of big, um, not proponents, but they were against the Enlightenment and the French Revolution. They called it the Anti-Revolution Party. And another little tidbit, the French Revolution was pretty much atheistic so you know as we can see there it was probably them trying to you know remove remove god out of you know the town square and to also bring in that postmodern way of thinking things that we're exposed to things that we see going on here in the united states unfortunately where we see um people think they know and know more than what the creator knows and that they can figure everything out it's you know it just goes into that stuff and and really it's cool that he stood up and he had his brother in arms and they caused shockwaves and he ended up opening a, a university and i believe it was called the orthodox um the orthodox uh university and it was a like free a free um, school, but uh, I'm gonna have to look that up again. But um, but yeah, so it was a, it's a free university, so it's pretty cool, you know. And I'm assuming he did that to combat like all the stuff that was going on. And there was another cool idea that that Kuiper did kind of um, coin or he applied the Lordship of Christ to, which is like uh, what he called sphere sovereignty, which means that like. Everything had its own sphere. You know, this is kind of how I understood it. Um, everything had its own sphere. And and really, there was a, a truth that applied to that sphere. And it was objective. It was not subjective, you know. And other spheres, truths couldn't come and morph this in, like, a, in a wrong sense. You know, so it was kind of cool how, like... The government had its own, like, it, it was in its own sphere, and, you know, it 
there was the biblical truth that should be applied to that, how that should be run, ran, etc. And then the family, there, it, it was his own sphere, and the Bible had its own truth applied to that. And then, um, you know, work, uh, business, etc., etc. You know, we can go on and on about that. And it just goes to show you, like, he was applying Christ to every single one of these spheres. And that's where we've come to, you know, Christ for all of life, you know, all of Christ for all of life. It's like we see the scripture that it can be applied um, not in the well, in the literal sense, but just, you know, taking it into context for our time. Like there's nothing new under the sun. Like what stuff that was going on is just it's a new shade but it's the same thing that's been going on in the past that's always come and resurfaced. It's the same sinful stuff that we've all dealt with, you know, um, since, you know, the fall. But it's just uh, it's just good to see that he really did apply those fears. And it's just something that really, to me, stood out. And, and kind of you compartmentalize and you apply all of biblical truth to that, like, sort of like subsection of life. Um, and, you know, that's obviously a short little intro to that chapter. And then there's a quote that I wanted to read um, from page 73 in case you have the book. Um, uh, and it's it's awesome what he says. And, and Kuiper says, and I quote, No single piece of our mental world is to be hermetically sealed off from the rest. And there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, Mine. So even then... Kuiper was all about the Christ for all alive, something that we should really grab hold of again and something that our pastor really does, you know, try to like hammer into our thick skulls that, you know, there's nothing outside of Christ that he does not have dominion over your, it's, it's over your diet, over the way you spend money, over the way you t raise up your kids, over the way you treat your coworkers, over the way you treat non-believers, etc. Like, Christ needs to be in all of that. And it's and it's whenever he is in all those spheres and is and is the objective truth that we base how we conduct uh, our business or our, our life in those spheres, it's it's always for his glory and we always benefit like in a good sense from that. You know, it's it's a very good chapter and it just really goes on a little bit about his, the history and just a little stuff that that Kuiper did. And then with that, we're going to move on to chapter 9. And this one is just called Newer Resources. I, I thought it was quite a uh, quite unique title. But um, it really goes on talking about the many men that came came after Kuiper, which is one of them was our boy Francis Schaeffer. You know, we loved his uh, a Christian uh, manifesto. That one was pretty cool. It was like, you know, kind of like, you know, the play on Communist Manifesto. But that one was a really good book that we did a Sunday School service, Sunday school uh, series on. Check that out. Um, but, yeah, it was talking about a lot of the men, the neo Kuyperians as they would like to call them, that um, came after him and kind of were like rocking the world and pushing this whole Christ for all alive, you know. And then... In this, this was a little, another a lengthier chapter. There was a cool part where it was kind of like the uh, kind of talked about science and you know how how um, the postmodern world kind of sees it. You know, they see it apart from God's truth. But you know, um, he really went into it talking about how that's kind of like a really like backwards way to do it. Whereas there's plenty of truth in scripture supporting you know like god is the you know the lord of science which we, we as christians we understand that but even then it's just he went on talking about that and he even said you know the author says that scripture is a source of of our christian worldview so it's not that we take scripture and be like okay cool that's that's a cool like input scripture but i'm gonna go figure this out on my own but no so we take what scripture says and we apply it to 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 our lives you know our spheres you know whatever we're doing and we build our truth on the truth of god which is the ultimate objective truth and there's something else that i know everyone has heard is the it might be true for you but it's not my truth you know sort of deal 
or maybe you know before the lord snatched us out of the fires you know maybe we were like that where we would tell people like hey that's cool that that's your truth but i don't believe that that's true and you know that's that's pretty that's a pretty evil thing because that shows that it's not really truth based on the objectivity it's a truth based on subjective subjectiveness so essentially like a truth based on opinion which is pretty bad because you know it's not fact and that's why he's kind of going on about the whole scripture is a source of christian worldview because scripture is truth it's in infallible truth you know outside of all the theology and everything some of that stuff is fallible because it's it's made by man though it's you know edifying the only thing that is infallible is the word of god and that's scripture so that's where we build off our worldview and our truth and we base our truth off of that so that's why when we get into apologetics and even van till makes a gets name dropped in here and he has a little section in this chapter you know we see where that's why we build upon apologetics because we don't go in and disarm ourselves no we arm ourselves with the truth of scripture and that's how we go and and uh you know engage the culture you know not not with our own subjective truth but with the truth that we've uh you know kind of girded up through scripture you know our own truth does not really our own it's it's the truth of the lord you know so that's that was pretty uh, cool part and then another thing that i saw which is called another section towards the end was multiple perspectives in um kind of this postmodern world and in the church so another cool thing with that was that you know that multiple perspectives are good in in the context of where they're being derived from so if they're being you know the multiple perspectives are being derived from the truth of the of the lord you know of scripture cool like that's something we can you know talk about you know like you know iron sharpening iron when it comes to that um you know that's 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 fine but it's also opens the 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 avenue of this multiple perspectives for some of us to to be corrected in a loving manner or you know of of maybe a bad doctrine or a bad understanding you know and um also or vice versa be taught correct doctrine theological doctrine you know of scripture and you know it just it opens up to where like um the body of christ the church is just operating healthy because if we have multiple perspectives that you know conflict with each other and one of them we is one of them is based on opinion like it's it's the body's not going to function as it is and there's going to be divisiveness divisiveness and you know splitting or arguing and bickering because of this but when we realize that we could have multiple perspectives and you know but within the basis of truth which is scripture you know and we can use that to uh, you know edify each other it just overall just showing that just because um we're allowed to have multiple perspective doesn't mean like like i said earlier like that truth has is their truth and you know we just leave them alone like no in the church like we all have the same truth all of it for the for the primary issues which is salvation we all have the same truth because it all comes from scripture not obviously there's secondary and tertiary things that we can you know discuss and argue till we're in glory but you know those things really also don't they're, they're not pertinent to salvation so that's like another thing that we can you know continue to like talk about but even uh even with this multiple perspectives it also allows us to really um exercise the ability of discernment you know to grow in wisdom to to learn to take what we lo- we hear from another brother or sister or, or another believer and you know go to scripture and see what scripture says about that if it is in scripture really or if it's maybe more opinion about from another pastor or something but in reality it, it just it really shows that we need to at the end of the day always go back to scripture and as the Bereans did like test everything through the scripture like not take anything like our pastor says like you guys need to have your bibles open as i'm reading it and reading along with me you know it's like you guys need to make sure that i'm you know you need to make sure that what i'm reading is actually in scripture and things of that nature like we always have to be um trying to grow in the that discernment and and uh and that wisdom so that 
we can have the whole body of Christ functioning together um, as one healthy uh, unit. You know, and that ends the 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 two chapters. It was very short and sweet. Um, I like I always say, I recommend you guys pick up this book, follow along. It's a very good book. You know, it's called The Lordship of Christ by Vern Poitras. It's a very good book, um, and really it helps to understand the all of Christ for all life. You know, and it comes highly recommended from our pastor uh, Martin. And, you know, he always is giving us good info and good books to read. So, yeah, till next time, see you all tomorrow.